Today at Whetstone Baptist Church, we mark our church anniversary. In Baptist churches, a church anniversary is an opportunity to remember the journey of the congregation from its foundation. Some people perhaps find that it's a traditional thing that has less meaning than perhaps it would have done in the years gone by. But I would suggest that it is still very meaningful, especially as congregations journey through this time of crisis, recognising that God has sustained them, and also particularly with a congregation such as our own, which has got a major building project and anticipation for the future, that it is valuable to recognise how God has led and guided us thus far. In some sense, I feel that there's a connection between a church anniversary and the biblical practice of raising a stone called an Ebenezer. We know the word often really through a name to people such as Ebenezer Scrooge in Dickens' Christmas Carol. But the origin of the actual meaning of the name is found in 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He named it Ebenezer, saying, Thus far has the Lord helped us. And so today at Whetstone we recognise that thus far has the Lord sustained us. About a year ago we gathered as a community uh, in a local school and we had the opportunity of making pledges to try and secure the final part of getting into our new home, a building that is now complete outside but not inside. We handed out on that occasion pieces of Lego brick as a sign that actually as we took this it can be an opportunity for us to also pledge our commitment financially towards making sure that the interior of the building is complete. COVID-19 has provided some delays but I'm glad to say that we are now on track for the building internally being completed by the middle of next year. And this has been a massive undertaking for the church, a building project costing something in the region of four to four and a half million pounds. And we are excited and anticipating that this new home will not just be a new home for us as a worshipping community, but also a new home for the village and for the context in which we are in South Leicestershire, providing opportunities for blessing and well-being for the many thousands of people who live in this area. Today we welcome, as a guest contributor to the service, Andy Dipper, who is the principal at All Nations Bible College. It is a college that focuses on training people for the mission field. He would have originally been coming to us actually with a group of students, but of course, because of COVID-19, he is not able to be with us and we're not able to meet either. But he will be ministering today through our online service, talking on Genesis chapter 12 and verses 1 to 4, an important mission text focusing on how God's promise to Abraham was actually a promise to bless the entire world. And this will lead us over the remainder of the month for some reflections on the mission of Jesus and how he equipped the disciples to go out and to share the life of the kingdom of God. And we will be looking the following two Sundays, the last two Sundays in November, looking at Luke chapter 10. So I trust that this Sunday will be a blessing for us. It'll be an opportunity for us to celebrate today God's sustaining love and power upon this community. And that those of you who are watching this, who are not part of Western Baptist Church, you can also celebrate with us God's blessing upon us and celebrate in your own lives God's keeping care. And that also over the following Sundays, we will be inspired alongside this Sunday in remembering that God has given us life and power, which needs to be shared with others. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt the
that never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down Good morning. It's an absolute joy to be with you today. My name is Andy, Andy Dipper, and uh, you've actually got Pam Bryan to blame for this. Pam Bryan was my tutor uh, when I was a student at All Nations Christian College back years ago, 20, 23 years ago, I think it was, a long time ago. And, uh, and Pam was, uh, was brilliant and she shook us up and we, she challenged us and she really laid, the, uh, laid it on the line that we, you know, we've got some really serious work to do for God in our life ahead. So I thank Pam uh, for being really inspirational for me uh, and for my wife, Emma, and for our little baby daughter, Jessie, who was born when we were here at college. And today we're going to be looking at global mission. Mission as a word, of course, it's, uh, you know, it's, got, it's quite a loaded word. And it's a word that we sometimes assume all sorts of things about it. Uh, but actually, it's, uh, it's got, there's a lot to be said in the, the Bible all about this idea of mission. Now, you as a church, I know, uh, are very serious about putting your faith into action. I know that because I've spent hours and hours and hours listening to and watching your uh, services that you've been running online since, uh, since lockdown back in March. So thank you very much for doing that, because I've really enjoyed uh, seeing each and every person. Phil's talks have been great, as has everybody else's talks as well. And uh, the worship has been wonderful, and it's just been really lovely. I particularly really enjoyed and was, a very, was very touched by last week's service, um, at, the, at the Remembrance Day service, as you churches together in the area uh, joined together for that, that ceremony. So thank you. So uh, let me just click on the uh, screen share thing. I've got a PowerPoint to, to go along with what I uh, am going to say, but uh, hopefully it will be helpful for us today as we think and ponder together about this idea of mission. Um, as I said, I'm the, uh, well, I didn't say actually, I'm the principal of All Nations Christian College, which means basically that I uh, clean the loose from time to time. I work on the budget. I do a bit of teaching. Uh, I talk a lot about All Nations and all sorts of places. I run the uh, online inquirers days. I probably do a bit of all sorts of things, uh, if I'm truth be told. And I spend a lot of time dealing with the regulatory pressures and responsibilities that any uh, higher education university has to deal with. We are basically a small private university or a kind of an offshoot, if you like, of the Open University. We offer their validated degrees, undergraduate degrees and postgraduate degrees. And we do a whole range of uh, types of studies, uh, courses from one day to 10 weeks uh, online and on site. Of course, everything that we're doing at the moment is this hybrid mode of learning 
flexible distributed learning, if you want the proper term. And that's what we spend our life on. But more than just the training, we're focused on equipping men and women for usefulness, God's usefulness in his world. So here's a little bit about me, first of all. So I've got three daughters. Uh, They're a lot older than what they are in that picture now, Uh, Jesse, uh, Charlotte and Polly. And we lived for about, uh, well, best part of 10 years between 1996 and 2006 in Afghanistan and served uh, various roles there, seconded from Tier Fund uh, into disaster management roles, mainly uh, working to build the capacity uh, of the country uh, to deal with natural and complex or human-made disasters of different kinds. Um, It was an absolute joy to get to know all sorts of people from all around the world. Uh, These are just four of my friends from different places, uh, from Afghanistan, from North Korea, from Nigeria and indeed from Iraq, because I spent also quite a lot of my uh, working life uh, in the field of serving the persecuted church. And I led the work of Release International and then latterly Christian Solidarity Worldwide. And uh, it's been a a joy, particularly uh, Al Hakim, that picture there uh, with the the man with the the headgear on, uh, he's one of the the leaders of uh, Shia Islam in the world based in Najaf, in the city of Najaf. And I had a real privilege talking to him, listening to him, actually understanding what his heart was and his concerns were for the world. And particularly, um, he was talk- we were talking about Syria at the time when I was with him some years ago now. But it, was, it did show me that it's really important for us to respect and listen to people of all faiths and none. As Christians, we have many opportunities to reach out into this world to be the salt and light of the Lord. And uh, we'll touch on that a bit further later on as well. But um, as well as that, I'm a um, uh, flight test engineer. Uh, Helicopters was my initial training. Uh, I um, uh, was based down in the Southwest, but I'm originally just from up the road in Nottinghamshire. So not too far away from where you are now. And I met my wife actually in a refugee camp in the middle of the Democratic Republic of Congo, back in the Rwandan refugee crisis in the mid nineties. So uh, it's been a very interesting journey so far and I'm really intrigued about what God has got in store for us ahead. I mentioned that I was from All Nations, our purpose of course, I talk about us training men and women together, um, effective participation in God's mission in his multicultural world is our focus. Uh, That means we uh, really focus on training people in terms of contextual theology, making sure that people know their Bible well. And uh, that's really, really important work in order to make sure that the foundations are there for all sorts of things that are coming up uh, in the future. I'm going to mention a few people that have come through the college and one person particularly that you know well. And our learning ethos really as a college is that we long for people to be transformed, transformed from when they they arrive to when they leave, but also transformed in the whole person, their head, their heart and their hands, that actually it's a a lifelong transformation that begins with uh, with their time with the community of all nations. And we have a lot of people that pop back uh, and are part of the team, actually part of the staff team uh, from time to time as well. So coming to you guys. So I spent some time looking at your website. Really, uh, I love the fact that you've got a uh, a mission section on your website. If you click into get involved and the next tab down mission partners, you can see all the different people that you as a church uh, support. And uh, I love the fact that you're focused on prayer and practical support. And I really was intrigued by your mission statement as well as a church. We are a community of faith that lives to glorify God through Jesus Christ in worship, making disciples, loving one another and serving the community. That is brilliant. Uh, I think you should just tell the world uh, about all that you're up to because we so need more and more churches that have that as their key focus. But also I thought to myself, it's all well and good, isn't it? Uh, Having this focus on praying and being practical as we serve others, as we enable others to be stepping into mission. But actually I put it to you, that actually it's the job is for each and every one of us. Uh, today, you know, job, the job vacancies, uh, would you want to you be an ambassador? Do you want to be a shaper in our world? Do you want to be a responder, a first responder? Do you want to be an assistant, uh, somebody that assists other people? Lord, when the challenges we face seem too big for us, 
we need to rely on you. When the mountain that we're facing, that we have to climb, seems too high, we need to rely on you. When we feel lost, directionless, we need to rely on you. Lord, we can never know what the year ahead is going to bring, but we know that you have walked those paths already. We know that you are there and we know that you strengthen and sustain us. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you have done that in this past year. How could we have known when we were meeting together in Brockington, Lord, last year at this time, what the year ahead would bring? And yet you have been faithful. Lord, we pray that despite the pandemic, despite this changed world that we live in, that we would rest totally and completely as a congregation on you, knowing that you are unchanging, pandemic or not, that you are unchanging, building project or not, that you are unchanging no matter what life throws at us. You are the rock upon which we can stand. You are the anchor in the storm. You are the strong tower that we can flee to. So Lord, as we celebrate our church anniversary and we look with renewed optimism at the year ahead, we know that we can't ever know what's going to happen. That last year was a stark reminder of that. But we do know that as a congregation we trust in a God who is unchanging, who is unswerving in his faithfulness, and who is undefeatable by anything, anything that this world throws at us. So we thank you, Lord, for the renewed hope and optimism that we have around the building project. And Lord, we pray in faith that that June deadline that we've set ourselves would be achievable, that Lord, you would bring the right people at the right time with the right skills to finish this project not for our glory not so that we can marvel in a shiny new building but so lord we as your demonstration of love to this village to this surrounding area can impact south leicester for your kingdom for your name and for your glory lord we recognize that this year ahead is going to be a significant one for the church and it will only it will only be successful if we decrease and you increase so lord we offer ourselves for another year as a body of believers into your hands into your powerful mighty hands knowing that when you move knowing that when you shape knowing that when you speak the kingdom and all the good that comes from it grows. How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night Then through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows
step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 4. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Uh, we've got three passages that we're going to be uh, touching on today, and uh, I think we'll have already read the, uh, the Genesis 12 passage and I just want us to now go through and draw out what the threads are in each of those passages and, and apply them into our context. Because Chris Wright, uh, who's one of our former principals here at All Nations, he wrote this in his book, The Mission of God. Uh, it's not so much the case that God has a mission for his church in the world as that God has a church for his mission in the world. Mission is not made for the church. The church was made for mission. This is God's mission. 
Do you get that? It's really important to, to, to turn this thing around from what we normally assume that mission, if you like, is something that the church does. But the point is that actually it's not so much that it's actually the other way around. Mission is the church. It really is vital. Some people would also argue that when we talk about mission, we quote the most famous verses in the Bible, perhaps on this topic, Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And remember, <clears throat> I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's great. What brilliant words that Jesus was speaking at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. But it didn't begin there. It didn't just start at the end of Jesus' ministry when he said, I'm with you. Uh, back at the, in the foundations of Genesis, here we are in Genesis chapter 12, and we have the account of the calling of Abram. The, the, the role had begun. His job had begun. Of course, he had a complicated background. And if you were reading the verses just before uh, the beginning of Hebrews 12, you realize that actually... Um, his, his uncle had helped out. There'd been a marriage arranged with different partners, uh, uh, different parties, sorry, for, uh, for Abraham's brothers. And actually, there was a calling upon them as a wider family to move from Ur through Haran to Shechem. The, that was the, the mandate upon the family and all of their uh, entourage to move. But they'd actually got stuck part way, and they hadn't gone the whole journey. And here we have God promising something very significant to Abraham and from Abraham. There's something that, of course, uh, like all uh, uh, people considering their future, he probably asked these four sort of questions about, you know, where are we? Who are we? What's gone wrong with the context? What is the solution? Natural things that we'd ask to understand the particular starting point the where we're at, understanding the baseline, as it were. And then he moves on to actually God laying out what, what that future is going to be. You know, remember just in the verses before, before that, it talks about Abraham uh, marrying Sarai and that Sarai was barren. That's quite a thing to say when then God says, I'm going to use you to be a blessing, not just uh, to, to be the father of the nation, but also to be a blessing to many other nations as well, a blessing far beyond the Jewish community. You can imagine him saying, I don't quite believe this. He was already an old man. And actually, this promise that God made was not something to be taken lightly. It was not something that was just half-hearted. It wasn't just something that it would be a hollow promise. It was a promise for the real future that Abraham was a really key part of. And this issue of him being a blessing to the nations is a repeated line throughout the whole of scripture that actually you don't just be blessed for your own purposes, your own sake. Actually, you're blessed so that you can be a blessing to many. And we see that ultimately in Jesus. But before we jump ahead, there's something really profound about the foundation of mission in the very beginning of the bible in the beginning of genesis there was a job to be done so abram was called and then he was sent there was a job for him to do as a follower of god and that is critically important to reflect upon if we were to jump ahead to matthew chapter 10 these are very familiar verses as well where jesus sends out the 12 disciples in martin goldsmith's very helpful book he talks about the fact that um it was not just a, uh, um, a calling, but it was a real imperative to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. That it had already been quite a, an amazing ride so far. The, the, the disciples had seen amazing things, but actually there was a calling to follow Jesus and then to be sent out. It was the ultimate training program, if you like, that they were filled up and equipped, and then they were sent into practical action to test it out and to fulfill the job that they had put before them. Of course, again, like we read in Genesis, it's a Jewish audience that the, the disciples were called first and foremost to speak into. Um, but actually, there was a bigger job. 
Jesus had already laid out his authority as a teacher of the law in chapters five to seven, and then he had the credibility to speak this mandate to these disciples to continue the ministry that Jesus began. The multiplying effect was critically important. Alan Hirsch, the Australian author, he said this, that every Christian is a sent one. There is no such thing as an unsent Christian. Now just think about that for a moment. That's quite a disturbing, disruptive statement that actually we, you and I, are called to be sent. In our world today, uh, the census of 2011 uh, tracked that there were 2.4 billion Christians in our world. And of that in the UK alone, 31.5 million Christians, that's 31.5 million people of the population of Britain said that they were Christians. Now, we all know that not everybody would probably be a regular church attender, far from it. The Evangelical Alliance in 2020 says that there are 2 million evangelical Christians in the UK. Even since lockdown in March, there's been estimates of more than 17,000 regular online services available. There is a lot going on. But I wonder how many of that, say, 2 million Christians in the UK, evangelicals in the UK, how many of them are actually putting their sentness into action? Now, being sent isn't just the going on an airplane to another country. Of course, we can't do much airplane travel at the moment. But there's a sentness, a sense of being called by God and then being sent into his world. If we were to jump ahead to Acts chapter 1, now you read this back on uh, May the 31st on Pentecost Sunday, and you talk, Phil talked about this. It's a great sermon, by the way, if you want to look it up on SoundCloud uh, or on your YouTube channel. These are very, very familiar verses. Now, of course, there's a absolute brilliant one in, <laughs> brilliant verse in verse eight, but there's a sense here that this time must have been tremendously disruptive tremendously disruptive again speaking to this jewish audience but the the it's only been 10 days since jesus had risen from the dead and the awfulness of the crucifixion and the phenomenal impact of the resurrection and it must have been so blowing the minds of these disciples it was still 40 days ahead before pentecost uh, what we read about in chapter 2 of acts but jesus appeared to the disciples and he assured them he prepared the ground for sure he equipped the believers gathered there in jerusalem but also he was saying that it's actually really important it's not just a blessing for themselves it's a blessing so that they can reach the nations yes they were facing struggle and suffering and as we uh, have re read and look at the rest of the book of acts you realize that the story of the early church is actually founded upon persecution and suffering and being dispersed but actually if that hadn't have happened the church today might well look very different even it might not even exist if that hadn't happened at the very beginning this was part and partial of the purpose of the church growing from that place of persecution Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That is phenomenal. Phenomenal. This group of people have taken that challenge in Nigeria very seriously. This was a, a picture taken in 2017. So obviously pre-pandemic, they weren't uh, social distancing at this point. Redemption City, this place in, uh, in Nigeria near Lagos, is home to about 5,000 um, houses. There are roads, power stations, police stations, a post office. Uh, and this is the center of the redeemed Christian Church of God, RCCG. RCCG is the largest and fastest growing, sorry, the fastest growing church denomination in Britain today. Uh, when I looked at this uh, Last, there were 685 parishes, congregations in the UK active, and they're also active in 180 countries. This is the church in, for, for Nigerian Christians, for this particular part of, of, your, of God's kingdom. And so 
what a beautiful picture of the fact that God has impacted and challenged a, a group of people to then sow into the church across the world. And there are Nigerian Christians, and not just Nigerian Christians, multicultural churches that are active in every town and city across Nigeria and in so many places all around the world today. That's the story of the spread of the RCCG. Now that's quite a challenge, isn't it? When we think about our established denominations in Britain, we do things a bit differently in uh, the CAV and in the Baptists and in the Methodist churches, but that's not a bad thing or a good thing. It's just a different thing. The reality is that the church today, the church which began from there in Jerusalem, the church has spread and changed and been transformed in all manner of ways. And they have been sent just like we are being called to be sent into the world to be witnesses, to be sharing the love of Jesus, the good news of Jesus. Interestingly, Matt Vaughan in his book on suffering in 2015 talks about another issue, another issue that is, that is challenging in our times. And the point being that actually, of course, this is written before, again, the pandemic, but the, the church largely is unequipped to cope with the problem of suffering. Our prevailing cultural circumstances have created a world in which any form of difficulty is seen as unnatural. Our culture prioritizes comfort, safety, and the elimination of risk. And these cultural values have seeped into the church. This is another difficulty and a challenge that often stops us in our sentness as church. We actually find ourselves wanting to just be, you know, warm and cozy, or we want to just look after ourselves, or we want to fix our own environment, and then we can be a blessing to the rest of the world. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to judge here. I'm not trying to say that you guys have, uh, have got some serious work to do here, but frankly, I look in a mirror and I think, this is my problem as well. I naturally default to think, how do I look after the world that I'm in? How do I look after this college that I'm leading here? How do I look after my family? Actually, we are, have seen this impact of suffering. Nearly 50,000 people in the UK have died from COVID across the world way more than a million people have. We can see that many people are suffering. There are huge struggles on our, in our very closeness, in our families, in our, in our lives. And we know that suffering and struggle is a very real aspect, real facet of life. And actually the argument would be that in our sentness, we are sent to be a beautiful fragrant offering of kindness and support into those situations. I was really impressed when I met Vicky, Vicky uh, Stanley, who was Townsend, who is now. Uh, she first came along to uh, to college for a, an open day a few years ago. Now, of course, you know Vicky because she was very much part of your your church fellowship. And Vicky was uh, she was a very busy person, uh, looking at uh, her uh, uh, performing arts work in Birmingham as well. And she didn't really know, you know, what her future would be. And she struggled and thought, well, how am I going to um, how am I going to, what am I going to do? How am I going to work this out for the future? How on earth am I going to pay my way through any kind of training? Well, she was initially thinking of doing a 10 week course. The long and the short of it is she ended up doing three years. And what she said, and I was asking her about this just earlier on today. What she said is that she has been transformed. She has been blessed so much by this training. But in order to be a blessing to others, now she, in her leading of the Endeavour 831 Theatre Company, she's able to focus on persecution and the issues of women who are uh, abused around the world. And in this fusion of these big uh, important issues of our time she's able to creatively and tenderly produce uh, content produce uh, plays and monologues that can open up and can really help minister to people who are suffering but also to present the issues in a very real way to an audience now she's also blessing other actors who are joining her there's something where she has realized that she has been blessed but also she is being a blessing to others there's another man in our tutor group uh, and he's called Pete and Pete is from the Netherlands and he's an engineer and so for so many years he's thought well yeah you know I'm doing my best in my work I'm trying really hard 
but actually it's, uh, you know, I'm just, I think there's a bit more. He's one of uh, eight siblings. He's the oldest. And he realizes that there's some, some, something else that he's got to do. And he's going now with uh, MAF uh, to be a, an engineer in their program. Probably, I don't know which country he's going to go to, but he's spending 10 weeks with us. And he is already, after just five, six weeks of being here, he's already said that he's being transformed. He knows he's being transformed in order for him to be a blessing. And on his journey, on his sentness, he needed to stop here for a while and to be filling up his tanks, as it were, charging his mind and his heart and his hands, getting ready to be able to be a transformational blessing to so many others. And then there's a couple, he, she's from Germany and he's from Britain. They have both been working in the, the health system, uh, the NHS uh, in, uh, in, in the UK and the, the German system there in Germany. And actually, they're people that are in their 50s and they've done short term work years ago and they've focused on their professional careers. And they thought, well, that's it. Job done. And I've done what I've done. I've done my bit. And now I'm going to settle and do whatever I'm going to do. But they've had this unsettledness within their spirit to be useful for God again, to be sent by God for such a time as this. And then of course the pandemic happens and then they're all confused again and thinking, hold on a minute, I thought I was gonna be sent. What does that mean? Well, they've come around to the, the realization that actually being sent is being useful for God wherever you are placed. And that's been a beautiful thing to see them and to walk that journey with them, discover that that is what God's doing in their life, using them to be a blessing to so many. And so for all of these guys, there's a sense of, doing things differently, recognizing that the world is changing all around us, that actually the world on our doorstep is much more complex and multicultural than ever it was even a few years ago. That's the way that life is. And we can be sent with confidence into that world, into those, those places that we find ourselves to be a, a blessing to so many. I don't know whether you find as you're imagine the days, these are pictures, of course, three of them from pre-COVID times, but imagine using the bus or the train or the tube and actually being able to have conversations with people. You know, maybe there's going to be that now. Maybe people will be talking. I know that for us, it's been a real blessing to get to know our neighbours during this lockdown, particularly over spring and summer. It'd be, it'll be tragic if we stop talking to our neighbours, having conversations with people in confident, normal ways, in our workplaces, whether that's on Zoom or in, a, in an office setting, that actually um, not being afraid of saying to people, this is what I believe, this is what is on my heart, and this is what I think is important, especially in our world where there is so much to be concerned about that seems to be falling out apart around us, maybe in the supermarket or wherever we find ourselves. This is the situation where, you know, frankly, you and I, are, 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 we have choices to make uh, and all of us are able to respond to God's call upon our lives. It really isn't a complicated thing. It's a very simple thing. If we go back to that kind of message from Chris Wright that actually mission is the church. It's not something that the church does. It is the church. So you and I are challenged before us to make a difference in our world. There's a very important question to be asked. You know, are we seriously ready? For that it's not like we have to be super specialists and it's only the few that are going to go to the tough places in the world we see that the simple guy who could have stayed put in genesis abram actually was obedient even though his wife was barren even though he was old and she was old and yet god told them that he would be the father of the nations, and be a blessing to others. These ramshackle group of people that were the disciples were trained effectively, very effectively by Jesus. And even people like Peter, who seriously messed up, who absolutely trusted God walking on the water, and then he said, oh, I don't know who Jesus is at the fireplace after when Jesus was being crucified. And then he was the one that Jesus said, feed my lambs you know, blessing him to be a blessing to others, being sent. And then, of course, the disciples there in Acts chapter 1, being sent to not just the local area and not just far, far away across the whole of the known region, but Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. There is a journey to go on. 
So for you and I in 2020, we could be paralyzed by all of the unknownness of this season. We could be looking at Brexit. We could be looking at the pandemic. We could be looking at our political systems. We could be thinking what our job's gonna be. Are we gonna be able to survive even? And we could think this winter is gonna be very difficult going forwards. We seriously need one another. We need to support one another. And also we need to have the confidence, the growing confidence within us that you and I are called to make a difference in our world. We are called to be useful for the Lord in all manner of places. So are you ready for that? Because God longs for us to, to be available for him and to be useful for him. I just want to close with a, a verse from Psalm uh, 61, a beautiful verse. Let's just pray together. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Amen. Let your spirit